October 25th, 2022 Oshkosh Common Council meeting. Please call the roll. Miller? Here. Wojciechowski? Here. Erickson? Here. Ford? Here. Mugerauer? Here. Hansen? Here. Palmieri? Here. All present. And Council Member Miller will lead us in the invocation, followed by our Pledge of Allegiance with our students from Valley Christian. Thank you, Mayor. We ask for your guidance today as we begin this meeting. May all those who participate in our discussions and our decisions reflect the values that we cherish in this great city. Come on up, kids. Come all the way up here. Come on up. You want to tell everybody about how your mom pushed you down the steps? <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have a couple of certificates for you here. Palmer, Palmer Helmuth, Valley Christian School. Thank you very much. And you must be Josie Jepson, Josie Jepson of Valley Christian School. Thank you again so much for leading us in the pledge. Nice job. So this evening we have uh, several proclamations, the first of which I'm going to read um, our recipients. Uh, this has been read previously, but we're rereading it. They're actually watching us live stream. This is the Take Back the Night Day 2022. Whereas sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence impacts all residents of the city of Oshkosh in the state of Wisconsin, whereas 68 Wisconsin residents lost their lives to domestic and interpersonal violence in 2021, including three residents of Oshkosh. Whereas sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence remain a vastly underreported crime, and whereas each resident of the city of Oshkosh plays a crucial role in ending and preventing sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence. Whereas the 32nd annual Take Back the Night event will be co-hosted on October 5th, 2022. It was actually hosted on the 5th by Christine Ann, Domestic Abuse Services, Reach Counseling, and UW Oshkosh. Whereas residents from the city of Oshkosh and surrounding areas are invited to virtually gather to honor victims and survivors of sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence and identify ways each person can be part of the solution to prevent sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence from happening in our community. Now therefore, I, Lori Palmieri, Mayor of the City of Oshkosh, do hereby proclaim sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence as a community issue and declare October 5th, 2022 as Take Back the Night Day in the City of Oshkosh and urge all residents to join Christine Ann Domestic Abuse Services, Reach Counseling, and UW Oshkosh in virtually gathering to end sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence in our community on October 6, 2022 from 5 to 8 p.m. And again, they've received a copy of this already. Our next proclamation. Whereas the city of Oshkosh is enriched by the knowledge and history of indigenous people who were here before the city's establishment, we acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Menominee and Ho-Chunk nations. This land encompasses the city of Oshkosh in the Lake Winnebago region. We honor these ancestral grounds and celebrate the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown. And whereas before European settlement, Native Americans lived throughout the land that is known as Wisconsin today, notably the Menominee Nation and Ho-Chunk Nation, 
had long inhabited ancestral lands in and around what is now Oshkosh, which was named after the Menominee's chief Oshkosh. And whereas by the end of the treaty period in 1871, most Native Americans had been forced to live on reservations in an attempt to assimilate tribes, their youth were placed in boarding schools throughout the United States. Some youth as young as three years old were removed from their homes, their language, and their traditions in order to civilize them into the dominant society. As a result, this mistreatment left them with a legacy of historical trauma. And whereas the city of Oshkosh recognizes that the atrocities the indigenous people endured as a result of European settlement and colonization, and whereas during Native American Heritage Month, we also honor our Native American <coughs> veterans and service members who have courageously served and continue to serve in our armed forces. For over 200 years, Native Americans have defended our country during every major conflict and continue to serve at a higher rate than any other ethnic group in the nation. Because of their selflessness, every generation of Americans receives the precious gift of liberty, and we owe each of them and their families a debt of gratitude for their sacrifice and dedication. And whereas indigenous peoples living in Oshkosh represent many of the 12 tribes of Wisconsin, whereas each tribe has a unique history and culture, indigenous peoples in the city of Oshkosh represent an important and valued part of our community. Their history is our history. Now therefore I, Lori Palmieri, Mayor of the City of Oshkosh, do hereby, hereby proclaim the month of November be recognized as Native American Heritage Month and encourage residents of the city to learn more about the history of indigenous peoples and to celebrate their culture. And our final proclamation this evening, Milo Cruz, would you come up and join me? This is a very special one. <clears throat> Whereas preservation of our parks and community is an effective tool to promote growth and sustainable development throughout the city of Oshkosh. And whereas second grader Milo Cruz, right here with us, has been an inspiration to other youth to help keep the community and earth clean for current and future generations. And whereas clean communities contribute to increased tourism and improved local economies, and whereas clean communities protect birds, fish, and other wildlife, and whereas litter in neighborhoods can misrepresent the area and contribute to health risk and low levels of self-image, and whereas clean public areas increase the value of an area and contribute to safe and welcoming spaces for all. Now therefore I, Lori Palmieri, Mayor of the City of Oshkosh, encourage the City of Oshkosh and its residents to join Milo Cruz in sharing his important words Please don't litter, save our earth, I want a future. And to continue to take actions in preserving our parks, community, and world. So we have Amy Albright here with us from the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And we have a little something for Milo. In addition to your proclamation, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to so put your, all you do. And we're going to put this right in your bag there. And we have another something here. <laughs> Can we take a picture of you in the hair? Wait, I turned around so it says Ash Cash. Says the PR person. <laughs> Always promoting. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Milo. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. That's incredible. Jesse, never follow a kid act. Sorry. <laughs> so next. <laughs> so we next have introduction of staff. Mr. Roddy. I feel a bit like I'm following magic here. I can't yeah. top that. <laughs> Jason, come on up here, please. Um, as council may recall from our workshop last week, we gave you a brief introduction uh, to our new utility operations manager, Jason Ellis, uh, but we also said we would be officially introducing you to him tonight. Uh, Jason was born and raised in Florence County, uh, located in the far northeast Wisconsin near the Michigan UP border. Jason attended Michigan Technological University where he earned his bachelor's degree in environmental engineering. After graduating, he accepted a position with the city of Oshkosh as a liquids operator at the wastewater treatment plant in 1999 in hopes of advancing with the organization. After serving as an operator for 13 years, Jason became the pretreatment coordinator, a position which he has held for the last 10 years before accepting this current position as the utilities operations manager. Jason still enjoys spending his time and friends uh, time with his family and friends up north at the lake and enjoys his many outdoor activities such as hunting and fishing. Jason has an eight-year-old daughter and two older stepchildren and is a proud Papa Jay to three grandchildren and one more on the way. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Jason and ask if he's got a couple things he might like to say. Sure. Thanks for introduction, James. Um, as he said, been with the city for about 23 years, uh, made it my home. Um, spent all those years with the wastewater treatment plant, and no matter what title I've held or position, um, I've always had a great sense of pride and accomplishment working for the city on behalf of the citizens of Oshkosh. And now I look forward to taking it to the next level, and I thank you all very much for the opportunity. Welcome. Congratulations. <clears throat> all right, next we have a presentation uh, from the Downtown Oshkosh Business Improvement District and an update. Hi everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me tonight. Um, I'm just here to give a little update on some of the things that we've been working on and things that we have in store for 2023. Um, we recently approved our operating plan and budget, so you'll see that in the future as well. So just kind of giving you an update on things we've got going on. Um, so just a little recap of what the bid is, a little refresher. Um, bid stands for Business Improvement District. So you can see on the presentation here, it is a district within our central city. Um, the bid was formed by property owners within the bid and community leaders in 1987. The 115 accessible properties within the bid pay a yearly um, special assessment to make up the annual bid budget. And our 2022 assessment amount was $140,610 um, with an operating budget of uh, about $183,000. Um, this year we'll, we'll be keeping our uh, assessment at the same rate um, and our operating budget will be slightly less at about $165,000. Um, I have a 12-person bo uh, volunteer board made up of property owners and tenants who represent the, our bid members. Um, there's yours truly, a full-time bid manager that manages all of the tasks designated by the board through our operating plan. Um, I oversee multiple committees and I represent downtown Oshkosh throughout the community and statewide. Um, some of our operating plan items include management, arts and beautification, our grant programs, events, advertising, our gift card program, uh, we have a member co-committee, and storage. Um, our key partners include 
the Oshkosh Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, my office is located within their office, and honestly, they're just a huge help to me when it comes to especially events and marketing. Um, their staff is, you know, they're volunteering and helping me with events um, and going out and taking videos for reels and TikToks and things like that. So there's a lot of daily collaboration that's happening between us. Um, they also employ me, and then we're, um, the bid reimburses the CBB. Um, of course, we work very closely with the city of Oshkosh, and I'll talk a little bit more about a new program that we, or a new partnership that we have, um, but of course, the city manages our administrative um, tasks and things like that as well. Um, we work with the Oshkosh Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. They've been a longtime partner of the bid since it formed in 1987, and um, along with the Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corporation, we work on um, a lot of collaborative efforts for business recruitment and retention. Um, along with them, the Community Foundation and JEK Foundation have been a huge part in a lot of the projects that we've um, completed in the last couple of years. Um, so I put beautification first on here just because it is one of our biggest budget items. Um, we plant, water, and maintain over 100 flower pots downtown, um, over 20 bump outs throughout the downtown area, and then fill all of those pots um, with holiday boughs and things for the holiday season. Um, we've put a lot of focus on public art in the last couple of years. Um, we had multiple murals installed last year, um, and then just had, this is a photo of our latest mural that was installed in August. Um, we are responsible for five seasonal banner changes throughout the year. Um, we took on the task of redoing all of them in the last year. Um, so that project costed um, just over 30, 000, or just under $30,000, so we fundraised for all of those costs as well. Um, and then the holidays, um, something that my whole world is revolving around the next couple of months. Um, we are the home to the community's Christmas tree and where a lot of people spend their holiday season. Um, and the, uh, in 2020, we fundraised over $20,000 um, thanks to the JK Foundation. We were able to light our square beautifully and get new lights and decor for our tree. Um, I know Travis probably <laughs> would not appreciate this photo that I and I didn't tell him I was putting it on there, um, but I just wanted to talk about a little a little bit about the new partnership that we've created with the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Community Foundation, JEK Foundation, and then the City of Oshkosh. Um, we do have a, a Parks Department staff person dedicated now to the beautification of our downtown and city roundabouts. Um, formerly, we had contracted all of this work out with a private contractor to do all of our green space maintenance, planting of all our flower pots, and all of those kinds of things. Um, so this person is responsible for planting, um, watering, maintenance, holiday decor installation. Um, so it's been really cool to have that direct uh, collaboration happening with the things that we're trying to accomplish downtown. Um, one of the things that the contractor that we previously worked with did was a lot of downtown garbage cleanup. Um, and so I, need, I knew I needed to kind of fill that, fill that um, task. So I got to researching different ways different communities did that, and um, I reached out to COTS, who recently opened in Oshkosh, um, and it is a partnership with COTS and River, Riverview Gardens. Um, they do this program in Appleton currently. Um, it is a downtown cleanup program that works with our homeless population. Um, and they basically right now are doing volunteering on Mondays and Fridays, but ultimately the goal of the program is to have it daily. Um, and there's either an incentive volunteer program where they're earning something like a bike or transportation um, for their time at, or uh, potentially being paid for their, their efforts. Um, so it's been a really cool thing to work on. Um, we actually reached out to Winnebago County because we needed a place to store all of our equipment. So they have been a big help to us, and I met the staff at the uh, State Street Center um, and actually was able to kind of connect that staff to COTS and Riverview Gardens, and there's been a lot of collaboration happening with um, local uh, community partners that are trying to accomplish the same goals. So um, one last beautification thing that we started in this past year was our blade sign and flower pot um, grant program. In 2021, we created a flower pot pilot program that allowed for flower pots of under 15 inches to be placed on North Main Street. Um, formerly, formerly they were not allowed um, to have pots. So like you see in the photo, um, there's small pots outside of the storefronts that just help add to the curb appeal downtown. Um, this is a, a 
project that was created in response to the Roger Brooks study. It's a grant program that covers six or 75% of the project costs up to $1,000. Um, just a little bit about public art because I talked about it already, but we had multiple installations last year. We wrapped our utility boxes. There's been a lot of momentum with public art downtown. Um, we had an installation this year, like I mentioned, and we have multiple projects in the works for next year. Um, and I just wanted to point out that a majority of the art projects that are happening downtown are um, paid for through fundraising efforts of the bid. Um, recruitment and retention is always going to be a goal for us. Um, I'm actively communicating with our bid members to keep them informed of opportunities um, from great grant programs to events that they can participate in. Um, I work co closely with our community partners, such as the Chamber and GoEDC on recruitment and retention efforts. And um, we also have a variety of grant programs for both recruitment and retention. Um, one other thing I wanted to note is that we became a Main Street Connect community this year. Um, so last year, they'd been wanting us to sign up for that program for a long time. So last year I did the application and we are officially a Main Street Connect community this year. And they have lots of access to resources, grants, things that our businesses can utilize um, for downtown. Um, I think this is the last thing on my slide. Um, marketing and events is obviously a huge part of what we do. Our entire goal is to make downtown a destination for the community and visitors. Um, we advertise and plan and support our events to help drive traffic downtown. Um, our advertising includes social media, um, print ads, city bus ads, um, doing collaborative ads that make ads more affordable for our downtown businesses. Um, the events that we put on are like Music on Main, a concert series and programming that we do, the holiday parade of course and many other holiday events. Um, we do wine walks, craft beer, we did a craft beer walk for the first time this year, chalk walk, um, tons of other ones. Um, of course there's the Dora Pilot program which we initiated to try to find a creative way to add to programming and vibrancy downtown. Um, for us it's been fairly successful and we haven't had any issues but we're going to continue to talk about it and see how we can improve upon it and see what it should look like for next year. Um, and then of course we also support some of our bigger downtown events like the Farmer's Market and Waterfest. Um, I guess there's tons of things that we're working on in 2023, but um, we really use Roger Brooks' study as a way to meet goals downtown. So that 250 days of activity that he had talked about is probably one of our bigger focuses for next year. Um, obviously, beautification has just become a big thing for us on its own. Um, but we're going to be increasing our Music on Main concert series and then adding a summer lunchtime series as well, just to add that more consistent traffic downtown, more days throughout the year. And then I just wanted to put a plaza update on here um, just because we had applied for ARPA grant. And um, I think Kelly Nyforth had mentioned um, last, last council meeting that we were going to be doing the House Seal Levine Imagine Oshkosh deep dive like was done for the Sawdust District, which I think is a really great way to go about figuring out what makes sense. Does a plaza make sense for Oshkosh? Are there, what other opportunities are there for us downtown? And I think that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions about anything, anything in our operating plan or budget or right now, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I thought we were gonna hear tonight about some new rebranding uh, things. Is that soon to come? I think it's very soon to come. <laughs> okay. Great. Perfect. Yes, it's very exciting. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. We're now at citizen statements to council. Um, we have a, a five minute limit. Citizens are to address council only. Statements are limited to five minutes, must address items that are not listed on the council meeting agenda, are limited to issues that have an impact on the city of Oshkosh. And the Common Council may address at a future meeting, must not include endorsements of any candidates or other electioneering. Who do we have registered tonight? We don't have anyone under general statements. Ah, I thought we did. Okay, so they must be only on specific agenda items. Yes. Okay. So we'll move on to consent agenda. We'll take a motion and a second. So move. Second. 
And who do we have registered, if anyone, for consent? No consent item. All right. Any discussion on consent? All right. Please call the roll. Miller? Aye. Wojciechowski? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Ford? Aye. Mugerauer? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. Carried seven. We have three new ordinances this evening, uh, none of which uh, will be voted on. The first one is 22448, remove 15 minute parking on west side of Oregon Street from 91 feet north of 16th Avenue to 19 feet north of 16th Avenue between 5 a.m. and 6 p.m. The second new ordinance, 22449, approve <clears throat> zone change from institutional district to institutional district with a planned development overlay for property located at 375 North Eagle Street. Plan Commission recommends approval. Madam Mayor, we yes. do have someone registered under this we item. We do. Very good. James Fox. Oh, <clears throat> apologies. Okay, thank you. I think I told you I'm voting no in the elevator. <laughs> <clears throat> and our third new ordinance is 22450, approve in intermediate attachment of properties from Town of Algoma, effective March 1, 2023, per approved cooperative plan, Zone C generally located east of Clareville Road, south of Witzel Avenue, and north of State Road 91. Is Mr. Lyons here? Just wanted to ask <clears throat> um, if we could just get a summary on this attachment of properties from the town of Algoma. Yeah, so this is the third automatic attachment that was uh, included in the cooperative agreement with Town of Algoma. So that's why we're up to um, the Zone C attachment. Memory serves me correctly, it's about nine properties that were established as part of this. Uh, per that agreement, by the end of uh, this year, we need to have the intermediate agreement uh, approved and finished. That way they can automatically attach in March of next year. Uh, we have one more of these coming up for Zone D. That's a number of years online. It's 2030-ish. Okay, so uh, folks who live in this area have all been notified, and they're uh, welcome to reach out to Community Development or Planning Services with any questions. Correct. All right. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to pending ordinances, 22451, approve amendment to comprehensive land use maps, Land use plan maps changing the land use designation of properties located at 1529 to 1539 Oshkosh Avenue from light density residential to neighborhood commercial. Plan Commission recommends denial. And do we have anyone registered on this item? We do have a number All of right. people. All right. And I think we also have in our packets. Um, <clears throat> a letter from Barbara and Philip Carpenter, just to note. Who do we have registered first? Eric Hyde. Actually, if you could step right over here, that'd be great. Welcome. Uh, hello again, everyone. You saw me all two weeks ago, and it's great to be back here. Um, so... When we buy a property, we have legal and social obligations that come with buying that property. And some of the biggest obligations socially are being good neighbors and making sure that we're not actively hurting our adjacent neighbors. And one of the things that has come up in discussion, especially with the Planning Council, was how much this plan, as it currently stands, will impact negatively the rest of the neighborhood. Um, now, this is not to say that we're not against possible changes in the future because we know that Oshkosh changes. Like, we, we are a great developing city. 
the city makes great plans for everything, but as it stands right now, and I don't know how many of my other neighbors are going to be up here speaking, but I want everyone to know on the council that we as a neighborhood are against this plan. Um, we did take feedback from the planning council about the fact that they would like to do a block by block audit of the city on that stretch of Oshkosh Ave. And we think that's a great idea because that, that, that shows that the city is planning out the street as a whole and not just incentivizing one person who may be willing to commit money to this at the cost of other neighbors. Um, now I know that there was talk about the evaluation of the two properties going up, more city tax revenue, but what it also doesn't consider is what we as neighbors would be putting into our properties if we know that this is going to be an area where we're going to have houses with neighbors that we can get along with that we know is going to build a strong community. I know I myself, I bought my house three years ago um, and I found out that there were things that were causing issues with the neighbors and I've spent money to fix them. I also know that I've been looking at improvements to my house. I have about $45,000 worth of projects that I would like to do. But because of this current situation, everything is on hold because we really don't know what's going on because if the city does approve this one spot, what happens with the rest of our block? We don't know. So we're, we're in a holding pattern then. We would rather see everything just condensed as one overview where we can all get together, decide, see what happens, and make sure that it's good for the neighborhood as a whole. As I've said last week, we have three big parks right next to our block. We have one on each side of our block on Oshkosh Ave itself, and we have one across the street. This is a perfect area for families to come in, grow, have their kids come over. We've got the river where people like to fish, and we've also got Oshkosh Corp not far away, so if an executive or someone with a family who works there wants to have a nice place close to home, it's within walking distance. The more commercial spots we put between us and them, the less residential area we have for the city to grow in, in and of itself. Um, so thank you for your time tonight. And you know, please be aware that we're not against change, but we want planned change. Thank you. Thank you. Norman Bach. Hello, I'm Norman Bach. I live at 2242 White Swan in Oshkosh. One of the reasons I attempted this plan is four years ago, the city of Oshkosh developed a TIF district. <clears throat> and that, uh, I, you probably all read it, but uh, one of my reasons for developing the new property that I had in Oshkosh Ave was this was laid out in 2018. In that project, on page five, number nine, the city estimates that 35% of territory will be devoted to retail business along that corridor. My project is or would not be considered retail, but rather office space. But it also mentions rehabilitations. I construe that to mean making improvement to Oshkosh Ave. It mentions the improvement of such area is likely to enhance significantly the value of substantially all of the other real property. This is in that report. That's also found on page five of that report. On page six, the finding that at least 50% by area of the real property within the district is in need of conservation or rehabilitation. As I mentioned at the last council meeting, I see only two properties between Sawyer and Eagle that are not in need of rehabilitation. Anyone who drives down Oshkosh Ave can see this with their own eyes. The TIF district only ex excludes the park area between Oshkosh Ave and Sawyer Creek. All the rest of the properties are in the TIF district. I happen to be 80 years old and I would like to help improve that area and I hope that some young entrepreneurs will finish a job to make Oshkosh Ave a wonderful entrance to the city of Oshkosh. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> Philip Carter. <coughs> Welcome. Hi there. My name is Philip Carpenter. I live in this neighborhood. Most of the homes in that neighborhood are owned by private people, not rentals. And I, I'm, the development is on the north side of the road of Oshkosh Ave, from, from Eagle Street out to the highway. And when they did that, they bought the entire area. They didn't come in and slap something up in the corner. And most of these homes, I don't believe, are in need of, of tearing down outside of a couple of rentals there. Uh, they're being maintained by the people that live in them. Thank you. That's everyone. That's everyone. Okay. Uh, we'll take a motion and a second from council. So moved. Second. Discussion. <coughs> Council Member Ford. Yeah, I just want to say a few things about uh, what happened at Planning Commission with this. Um, we did vote it down uh, in, in Planning Commission 6 to 1 on the grounds that it would be detrimental to the neighboring properties. Um, we did have a workshop before. Um, I don't want to speak for the whole plan Commission, but I think there was an openness in that workshop to the idea, um, provided the neighbors were on board. Uh, as we heard tonight and as we heard at Plan Commission and we heard last week, the neighbors are definitely not on board. Uh, for me personally, I think it'd be different uh, if it was part of a larger development strategy, and that's not, I, I understand what you're saying with, with, with the TIF district, but that's very different than having a actual plan uh, for that area. Um, and right now we don't, right? It really is just that corner. And again, I'm open to it, mixed use, neighbors change, but this is definitely not NIMBYism because, you're right, it's just one corner. It's not part of a comprehensive plan, um, and the neighbors don't like it. So I'm happy to defer to the neighbors on this one. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, somewhat echoing Councilmember Ford's statements, um, a larger plan is, is definitely needed for that quarter. We know that as a city, that is um, ripe for development. We have a, you know, an idea and a plan to, to come at um, the intersection of Sawyer and, and Oshkosh Ave there in, in a few years once we have uh, enough funds available to, to redevelop it, uh, that intersection itself. And then I can see that entire corridor from there out to the highway you know, uh, up for redevelopment. Uh, in between now and then, it does take someone ha with some initiative to, to try to start that, though, too. Um, timing, maybe the timing isn't the best on this one, but it's got to start somewhere, uh, if that's our intention, to, to have that corridor redeveloped. Um, but it does sound like a, a, a full, comprehensive, you know, uh, actual uh, plan for that corridor, for those few blocks, is actually what's needed. Um, before we start that, so um, I'll be, uh, I'm supportive of the idea, but at this time I think it's just not, it's, I don't think there's the votes for it and, and Planning Commission was right to, to deny this one at this time, I think. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mayor. Kelly, can you, can I throw you under the bus here? Sure. Wait a minute. So I, I, I can see both positions, but it, but it can also be Difficult when when we throw a TIF district out there, we're saying, "Hey, come come invest in this area," and and I think therein lies the confusion where part of the city is say, "Hey, come on in, welcoming," and then when when they come in the door, we're like, "Ah, oh, we were just kidding, uh, ha ha, try again." But can can we can we talk about? It? I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, I I don't think it's a secret. Oshkosh Ave is going to be the 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 new gateway to the city um, and it, it's only a matter of time to come so I mean I think so we can appease the homeowners and the investors what what are what are our next steps absolutely um, the TIF district that was created TID 35 when Oshkosh Corporation um, started construction at their global headquarters um, we created TID 35 uh, for the city, it was a city-initiated TID to collect all the increment from that redevelopment that was happening in the area to use it for public projects. Um, one of them that we are shooting for is that Sawyer Oshkosh Ave reconstruction for that intersection. Um, we did include um, in information about potentially helping rehabbing um, homes in that area also. So, you know, it, it is an area that we do see some need for redevelopment. Um, that doesn't mean everything is 
um, you know, demoed and something new is built. Um, it could be rehab. There could be existing single family staying in that area. Now, um, what we heard from the neighbors and from plan commission members when we did have um, this item on their agenda is they wanted to talk about it in more detail. So we are going to be having a workshop, I believe, in a couple weeks about maybe a, uh, the 15th meeting potentially the November 15th meeting um, to get you know PC's kind of feedback on how do we want to go about this and it does need to be a larger more corridor type conversation and not one parcel at a time um, this would require a comp plan amendment so that's kind of the starting point of our discussions and obviously um, those would be discussions that neighbors would be engaged with plan commission council and you know to get everybody's opinion on what kind of our future vision for this area is sure thank you so, but it would be safe to let the homeowners know there's a lot of investors buying up properties there, as we heard at the last council meeting. So, uh, it, there's certainly you know folks that are looking to sell or looking to buy, and um, you know we don't control the market, and no, that's I'm, not our. Right. Um, but it's you know um, depending you know what projects people bring forward or people acquiring properties, um, you know that's something that we'll have to take up if if that's brought forward to us. Thank you. So, so this is a, um, a really timely discussion, I think, too, because, you know, as we um, are trying to invest in that area and attract investors, but also um, the um, industry and commerce and retail also need to ensure that their employees have workforce affordable housing. That doesn't mean that the plan that would come up, I believe it was, was mentioned, would not include um, the redevelopment or rehab um, of homes. So that that corridor doesn't necessarily exclude residential. Um, so it would be interesting to see what those next steps and discussions are about a great, greater overall plan. Uh, so I will be voting no on this item. Please call the roll. Miller? No. Wojciechowski? No. Erickson? No. Ford? No. Mugerauer? No. Hansen? No. Paul Mary? No. Item fails. Our next ordinance is 22452. Do we have anyone registered on this item? <clears throat> no. All right. I'll take a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. This is a proof request to annex to the city from the town of Oshkosh, Pontonin House Annexation, 2538 Shorewood Drive, and part of 2534 Shorewood Drive. Plan Commission recommends approval. Seeing no discussion, please call the roll. Miller? Aye. Wojciechowski? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Ford? Aye. Mugerauer? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Carried seven. And pending ordinance 22453, amend sections 17-33E and 1744, and creating sections 1744.1 and 1744.2 of the City of Ashkosh Municipal Code pertaining to weed cutting and lawn care and native landscaping areas. Sustainability Advisory Board recommends approval. Is there anyone registered on this? No. All right, take a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Again, I'd just like to express appreciation to the uh, UW Oshkosh students that first brought this uh, native landscaping ordinance to us was that a year or two years ago um, yes yeah, certainly appreciate all the work that went into that and the sustainability advisory board and we'll take the roll Miller aye Wojciechowski aye Erickson aye Ford aye Mugerauer aye Hansen aye Paul Mary aye carried seven Okay, we are at council discussion and direction to city manager and future agenda items. Do any council members have uh, future agenda items they'd like to recommend? 
I would like to um, ask that we consider or discuss the potential of a review of our boards and commissions. It's been about seven years, I believe, since the last review uh, for the purpose of uh, determining perhaps either size or number of boards and uh, some of the continued need and purposes. I see heads nodding. So it looks like we have several <coughs> council members who are interested in adding that as a future agenda item. Is that pretty standard? Seven years or what's the? No, that's locusts, but th that's a different story. <laughs> no, um, 17 years. There, there's, yeah, 17 years. No, that's cicadas. Uh, cicadas. Yeah, yeah. cicadas. Uh, that was done about seven years ago with the request of council. So um, I think periodically, yeah. it, that's certainly up to council. It's appropriate. Um, you know, we've we've had discussions about that. Um, you know, cause and effect of different things. So. Uh, I certainly would welcome that. There may be, uh, we're put, talking about putting it on a future agenda. So if if there's a consensus, uh, get, things we can talk about is do you want to create a perhaps a council subcommittee? Staff had done it the last time, but I know with council liaisons, they might be able to offer some perspective and I'll leave it up to the council to decide how they want to do it. But staff's certainly uh, ready, willing, and able to uh, to support whatever you want to investigate. Yeah, putting that on the agenda. Mm -hmm. All right, future meetings, joint meeting with the Oshkosh Area School District Board and Oshkosh Council, Thursday, October 27th at 5 p.m. at the School District Administrative Office on Eagle Street. Uh, that's this Thursday. And future workshops, uh, budget workshop, which may be optional. We may or may not hold that after the public hearing on November 2nd. 2022 at City Hall at 5 p.m. Uh, let's see, Council Member Ford would like to discuss graffiti ordinance clarification of standards for abatement. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So I've gotten multiple uh, contacts about the way graffiti is removed uh, in the city of Oshkosh, specifically when it's removed or covered that it still looks like uh, graffiti. Um, so I went down, take a look at the, uh, the code, and the language just says remove or cover. Graffiti. So, I mean, I think you can literally just take some black paint and cover up the whatever nasty thing they wrote about Councilman Miller. Sorry. So, so you, so you, so you didn't cover it up, is what you no, said. No, I didn't cover it up. <laughs> right, but you could like so literally, you could, you could just you could just do that, and you'd meet the letter of the uh, the ordinance as written. So, um, I was hoping that we could add some language there that clarifies the expectation that graffiti is removed or covered in a way that matches the color and texture of the original surface. I think at the very least that would provide some direction for folks that are addressing graffiti on the side of other building. Um, so just seeing if there's any support here in the council for uh, moving forward on uh, an amendment to that ordinance. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think it's actually uh, it's a good idea to get some some uh, feedback from from planning staff. I know they've run into this a number of times. We had a yeah. we had I know uh, the last one I can remember was some. Um, some interest in re regards to something that I think that was uh, sprayed onto the the Miles Kimball building that was um, just before they started their redevelopment and planning staff engaged on that but on a very similar topic and a very similar um, commentary from some of the citizens here so uh, in terms of what's appropriate what what other communities do seems seems reasonable um, how many uh, what's the frequency or, or amount of uh, I guess graffiti or tagging that's going on do we know that? I'm not. I don't. We're not prepared to to provide that information at this time. I can certainly check with staff in terms of the frequency of those types of complaints. Uh, some of that's done through C Click Fix. Other times we get calls. So it comes from a variety of sources. Yeah, if we could have that when it comes up, that'd be great. <clears throat> And then uh, we're at item 32, direction to staff in preparation of the 2023 budget and capital improvement program. Madam Mayor, we have two um, people who would like to speak on this item. Yes. Kenneth Osmond. Ken Osmond, welcome. Thank 
Ken Osmond, 313 West New York Avenue. I own Planet Prayer Cafe, and I also am on the Sustainability Advisory Board. I'm here to speak in favor of the creation of the new uh, Sustainability Manager position, but also offer a few thoughts that I have on it. You know, number one, AC Sustainability is having three pillars. One is certainly environmental, one is social, um, and one is economic. Uh, therefore, I see this type of position uh, having a direct line report to the city manager. I also see them having a dotted line to every uh, uh, advisory board and or department head. Um, that person's role should be one to assist uh, in impacting every project, every ordinance, in order to have some sort of thought to sustainability. That being said, um, the city already does a great number of things in these areas, but none of it's ever tracked or reported out to the citizenry. In other words, the council and the city does a good job. So I also see this person being solely responsible for maintaining a sustainability dashboard that actually tracks the impacts in those three pillar areas, because we do do positive things in all three of those things. In addition, um, I believe the focus uh, because of those three pillars should be actually be on the first two. Sustainability in terms of the environment because it is and to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, uh, most often because those two things are inherently intertwined and have an immediate impact. I would like the emphasis placed on somebody who has the sustainability background, but also a person who knows how to get money to the city to support all three pillars. Uh, we want somebody who thinks holistically about those three pillars, uh, and we want to have impact across those three pillars. So in support of the position, just wanted to offer my thoughts on how we should look at it and if it does go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Dwyer Halquist. Welcome. Um, I'm Pat Dwyer Hallquist. I live at 2030 Hazel Street, and I'm also a member of the Sustainability Advisory Board. And I'm here to ask that the Common Council include in its budget proposal initial funding for one year for the position of sustainability manager for the city of Oshkosh, much like um, Kenny Osmond is supporting it. My main interest in sustainability is really energy efficiency and renewable energy. energy. However, sustainability covers much more. The city's sustainability plan describes sustainability as meeting current environmental, social, and economic needs of our community while ensuring the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So in a sense, this is like those three pillars. Um, it's important to note that while sustainability is usually thought of as an environmental issue, it's also important socially and economically. Sustainability efforts pay off both in terms of quality of life and financial savings. Um, in the five years I've served on the Sustainability Advisory Board, the board has heard 22 reports from environmental studies students at UW Oshkosh, at least 22. There's 22 listed. There might go back further than that. I'm not sure, 2018. Uh, one of those reports is the one that recommended the creation of a sustainability manager position. Um, progress on evaluating and implementing these proposals and other sustainability projects that have come up, it's really been slow because there's limited staff time to focus on sustainability currently the way things are now. The staff liaison to the Sustainability Advisory Board is given four hours each week to work on sustainability. That's not enough, you know. There's so much that could be done. A full-time full sustainability manager would help to secure grant funding for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects, uh, could work on improving energy efficiency in city-owned buildings, could um, develop renewable energy on city-owned property, uh, could help to review city code to remove barriers that prevent Oshkosh citizens from pursuing renewable, sustainable home projects, improvements, and also help city departments work together on sustainability issues. There's a lot that could be done. And while there is this upfront cost of creating a new position, there is going to be payback in terms of grants and decreased operating costs due to lower energy bills, and I think probably also you expect the cost of energy to go up in the future, so maybe a little better handle on controlling increased costs in the future as energy costs will likely go up. Um, and I think the hope with this position, too, is that because of grant money that the um, sustainability manager would apply to, that it would become at least partially self-funding. It wouldn't be self-funding the first year, but with time, 
triplets the amount of money that they could raise and also you know help to save the city in terms of better use of our energy resources um, would um, you know would be at least partially sustainable would be partially self-funding um, so at any rate I think a sustainability manager would would um, help the city of Oshkosh move into a more sustainable future so thank you for listening thank you Councilmember Ford. So I, I assume this would be the right time to weigh in on enhancement requests and give you direction, Mark? That's pretty much what the intent was, yes. All right, well then you're gonna get it. Um, <laughs> With both barrels. <laughs> no, no, no. So so I have, I have real concerns about this uh, this package of enhancement requests. And it's not about the, the worthiness. Um, there's merit in all of these items. I think it's more about fiscal realities. You gotta remember this is a one-year spending plan, but it has long-term implications. So a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, this budget very smartly sets aside money in anticipation of our compensation study. Uh, but it's safe to assume that study is going to recommend that we increase um, a pay for our employees. Um, and certainly that's, that's the right thing to do. Employees are our most important asset, but they're also our most expensive asset. We've got to recognize that's going to be a cost that occurs in perpetuity. That's going to be pressure on our levy forever. ARPA funds have been a blessing, but they've been a one-time thing. Um, when they're gone, we're going to face even tougher decisions regarding deferred maintenance, new debt, reduced service capacity in our capital plan. We've seen utility fees increase over the years. So when, when I look at these levy-free enhancements that are before us, they still cost money. They still place burden on our residents. Um, if we approve them, we're going to have no choice but to hike up fees when they come before us. Um, last year it was in December, but whenever that comes before us. So we're really making a longer term decision here that we might even realize. Um, then let's look, look at like externally, economic conditions. Inflation means things are going to keep getting more expensive. We've already seen that happen with our parks building. That stuff's going to keep happening. Interest rates increases mean that we're not going to be able to get money cheap anymore. That also is going to limit our ability to refinance. And we've done that in the past as a very, I think, smart way to free up cash. But we're not going to have the options of doing that moving forward. And as I said at the budget workshop, I found the sheer number of uh, enhancement requests a little bit overwhelming. Um, it's definitely, I think, evidence of a disconnect between uh, the needs of our government, the needs of our community, and the fiscal realities we're facing, uh, both in our government but also in our homes. Um, I know at our first workshop, myself, along with all of you, we all agreed to about a 4% levy increase. If I'm speaking out of turn, correct me. Uh, but at least for me, that wasn't a starting point. That was my comfort level, balancing the city's need uh, for more revenue, hence the 4%. This is not me saying zero or cuts. Um, but we have to balance that with residents' ability to pay. And again, it doesn't mean the enhancements aren't worthwhile. Um, I personally, and I, I've been vocal about this, I think the DEI coordinator is essential for the future of the effectiveness of our government. Honestly, hearing today about the sustainability, you all put that a lot better than I've heard that before, and I appreciate that. Um, I think there's huge value there. And I know my colleagues feel just as passionately about any number of these 19 it's actually 20 because there's a 15A in there. Russ tried to slip that through. Yeah. Right? I know people feel just as passionate about all these things. And I, and I don't blame <coughs> the finance director. I don't blame uh, the city manager. The state local partnership has collapsed in this state. Um, we have this $4.3 billion state surplus while we're struggling to provide basic services, while property taxes are going up and fees are increasing. That doesn't make any sense. And I can't make state legislators do their job, but I can sure as heck try to do mine. And that's what I'm doing here. It begins with voting no on all these enhancements, with the exception of one-time expenditures paid with either our ARPA funds or our fund balance, because that would be consistent with the fiscally responsible policies we all passed as a body. So I can certainly go there. I would ask that if there are any essential items that were in these enhancement requests, that they be brought to us, if they're going to be on the utility or they're going to be funded with the levy, that they be brought to us with corresponding recommended cuts um, so that we can reprioritize and hold the line at the uh, levy increase that at least I'm comfortable with. Um, I also hope that next year we take a little bit of a multi-track process with this because I think we have to be prepared for the economic situation to get worse and we also have to be prepared for the state fiscal relationship, state local fiscal relationship to get worse. And I want to be in a position next year that we can be proactive instead of reactive. Hopefully we'll be wrong and things will work out just fine but we've got to be ready if they're not. And I'm sorry to be a downer here. I've been smiling all day for other things, but this is right. This is depressing even to talk about. It brings me no joy. I want to vote for all of these things. 
right? I, I truly do believe, uh, having worked here now for, for two years in this position, two and a half years, that the people doing the work, they know best what they need uh, to do their jobs. But we got to be realistic here. Um, and I think a 4.1 per night, 4.19 percent levy um, is, is my ceiling. So um, that's my feedback as one of seven. Thanks for listening. Deputy Mayor. Got me before I even hit the button there. Thank you. Um, no, thank you, Councilmember Ford, for those for those sentiments. I'm I'm echoing something similar. Um, so, you know, led by City Manager Roloff and the finance team under Mr. Van Goppel's direction, you know, department heads um, they have presented a balanced budget, right? We're required to, uh, and it met Council's direction of maintaining our current services and a roughly four percent levy increase. As Councilmember Ford alluded to, that that wasn't the starting point. That was that was the um, that was the intentional ending point. That was at least the the intent was landing around four percent. That's what we've done the last couple of years. Um, and while that may even have been uh, more than some, including myself, were were comfortable with, that's that was the direction from Council land around four percent. So as presented, we have a four point one nine percent levy increase. That's one point eight million dollars more than twenty twenty one. Driven mostly by contracted wage increases, implementation of the staffing, salary study, and health insurance cost uh, increases. We are in the service business, so it's not unexpected that budget increases will mostly be attributed to personnel costs. And, and I support those, and, and, and this isn't about being against any of those. So uh, completely expected that, that those are what's going to drive our budgets annually. What I'm concerned about is that this council could quite easily blow past that directed 4% levy increase and balloon that by looking at this list and easily adding anywhere from 10 to 12 positions. Um, many of which I'm, I'm supportive of uh, on a personal level, but professionally in this role, um, we can't just say yes to the easy stuff. You have to sometimes say no to the difficult stuff and, and, and it may be uncomfortable, but it's what's required. I'm concerned that um, there easily could be yes votes for items that really have not been fully thought out by those that requested them. Uh, equally frustrating is that there seemed to be a lack of prioritization of these requests. Instead presented as an a la carte menu for council to choose from, almost as if uh, to choose, and I hate to use the term, but pet projects to, to fund those ideas. Um, that's not what this council is about, and, or nor should it be about, but that's the way it, that I see that some of these votes could potentially easily go. So I left last Tuesday's budget workshop uh, pretty frustrated, probably the most frustrated I've, I've been leaving a, a, a budget workshop I've, I've been a part of in five years. Um, presented with a slate of 19 requests for enhancements. Um, and I'm not sure that those were fully vetted or that um, I'm, I'm also not sure if some of these requests were made to ensure that departments had visibility by requesting more assistance for their departments, or even if there may not have been an absolute true need at this time. Um, or that maybe some of these enhanced requests were just assumed they'd be approved, so little to no work was done in preparation for their presentation to council during those budget hearings. The requested 19 enhancements total one point f more than $1.5 million. If fully approved, be nearly a 6% levy increase, and as Council Member Ford alluded to, would also drive up utility rates in the fall and in the spring when we approve those rate increases. I know it's, it's easy to vote yes. Um, that tends to be the easy way out, though. So it's difficult, and, um, but at times needed to say no. And while I am fully supportive of a lot of these enhancements, it's irresponsible to say yes to too many. Uh, so at this point, given the, the process of what could possibly transpire with votes being on the table, um, I won't be supporting any enhancements at this time. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my experience le leaving our budget meetings was a little bit opposite of, of uh, Mike and Matt's. I actually left there feeling pretty good until I started plugging and playing some of the cost to the taxpayers uh, in Russ's uh, spreadsheet. And when you look at uh, the impact of these um, costs 
to the levy to the 85 year old widow or living on 6th street that that doesn't have a pension or or any type of other income is is, is criminal we we just we have to stop taxing our most vulnerable um, along with that statement um, I, I would challenge staff to to go back to the drawing drawing board and um, maybe prioritize these things a little bit uh, I, I, I don't want to say better because I, I know you guys are working your tails off I mean this is this is just an insane amount of work um, and I appreciate every every bit of it um, I, I also have uh, some things, some positions that I would support, but but what is what is fair to the city, um, what is fair uh, to the people in this bu building and things just just aren't jiving right now. Um, like I said, I, I left the meeting somewhat confident we could figure this out until we started putting the cost together. And quite honestly, the big shocker for me is um, we, we we've we've been promising our our, our hardworking employees and partners. Uh, this this wage study, and this is going to be astro bucks. And and the 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 city and the council and staff have been responsible putting together or putting some money aside. But but that that's short lived. That's that's only going to pay for a couple years of uh, of salary increases and things like that. Um, so it, it's when you add all of it up, it's it, it it's a shocking number um, that that I just can't swallow right now. Um, with that being said, I, I, I would like to turn it back over and, and um, see if uh, see if staff can maybe justify some of these a little bit better is a bad word, um, but but just prioritize them for us maybe. Um, but I, I currently can't support uh, any increases at this time either. Thank you. Other council comments? Well, I'd like to say that um, I agree in part uh, with fellow council members that, um, you know, when we think about <clears throat> there's a 30% increase in WPS uh, energy bills expected this winter, um, and that public hearing, I think, is actually just next week. Um, we know that, you know, we're at over 8% inflation on General consumer goods, 7%. We're likely to, I believe it's 7% on our, our water increase um, and the tax increase. And what also is part of this that's, you know, shows up on the tax bill is, um, you know, the, the school uh, amount of that as well. And that's <clears throat> greatly increasing. But with that said, um, I do think it makes sense to um, look at things like a one-year, one-time uh, sustainability manager attempt to bring some dollars back in and savings through um, some of the efficiencies, uh, energy efficiencies, as well as um, grants. Because I, I really look at what was being asked for in the sustainability manager as more of a, a grant uh, writing uh, opportunity. <clears throat> and um, I also would say that there are some difficult decisions here. There's some so many priorities that are, you know, public safe from public safety to our drinking water to our library collection um, and facilities maintenance. But with all of that competing and not, uh, as was stated, really fully fleshed out, I, I feel that this council and the community uh, should really work on a priority-based uh, budgeting based on an inventory that community value can be assessed on our existing programs and services uh, before moving ahead with uh, such an increase. So I'll pass it on to other council members at this point. Council Member Miller. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Russ, can you, can you, can you access this document? Can, can you? Can you put this up for us or, or walk us through this? Or can I put it under the? Um, actually, if um, if I may, um, you also have a copy of it that was distributed 
um, at the last uh, budget workshop. But if you don't have it with you, I have some additional hard copies. It's not in your red folder. Let me just pass it around real quick. But and let me just say for people at home, this this is this is on our is this is this currently updated on our I, website? Not yet. Not yet. Um, okay. But what we have on, on the screen tonight is the last part of this slide on this two-page handout that talks about tax dollars and where it goes. And I think the residents, some, most residents know, but some residents don't, is that when you pay property taxes, you're not paying the city dollar for dollar. For every dollar of taxes you give to the city during tax collection, the city of Oshkosh keeps 40% of that. 36% uh, goes to the schools, 20% goes to the county, 4% goes to Fox Valley Tech. So of that 40%, and based on our base budget right now, without any enhancements, um, the typical home would pay about $150 a month for city services. So when you look at where that $150 per month would go, again, that's on a typical house. We do have debt that we're obligated to pay, and that's a, a huge portion of that, about $44 a month goes to debt. Uh, police uh, services is just over $22 a month. Fire is $20 a month. Public works, $10 a month. Library is $10.27. General government's $9.60. Garbage collections, $5 a month. Transit and transportation services, are $4.48. We invest in capital projects each year to the tune of approximately a million dollars, give or take. Um, that turns out to be $3.74 a month. Uh, parks, we invest $3.69 a month. Street lighting is $3.98 a month. The museum, we invest $3.59. Community development, $2.95. Our senior services, we invest $1.21. Our cemetery, we invest $1.11. And again, this is all on monthly costs. And then all the others account for about $3.36. So this is the breakdown of what you have in the budget that was um, proposed. And we discussed a levy increase of 4.19%. Um, Maybe I'm, I don't want to be out of my lane. I want to be providing you financial information for you to make decisions. And, and the, the direction that council wants to go is certainly a legislative process that you have to follow. Um, but as finance director, uh, in your packets, there's a, a 2023 budget amendments. Um, but there's also one in your red folder tonight. I would, I, would, I would like to direct you to that red folder for just a quick minute um, because I think there's some things I'd like to just point out uh, on that. And it would be, if you're looking at the bottom of this form, it would be updated as of 10-25-22. So that, that's the budget enhancements. You've seen those budget enhancements before. I took my own liberty to rearrange them based on my view of finance is not the legislative view. So please bear with me for just a quick minute. Um, and again, I want to start with that levy increase of 4.19 that, that some of you are, seem to be comfortable with. And I assumed uh, from a finance director's perspective, if the council were to consider enhancements two, three, and four, and four has been amended to add two police officers on July 1st or six months of the year, that would, those three budget enhancements would increase the levy from 4.19% increase to 4.66% increase and would increase the tax rate by five cents. Again, that is me providing you financial information and I certainly want to respect your legislative decisions and, and the, Hopefully the city manager is not going to hit me. <laughs> no. And the well, other I, thing. Can I just ask? So a six-month position, I assume that's a full-time position. It would be a full-time position We're by on, part -time on July 1st. It okay. would be two full-time positions starting on July 1st. Okay. Thank you. So you'd have the full impact of that the following year. So there's a little bit of 
I call it the ticking time bomb. There's a little bit of that in, in that, but the idea is to soften the blow. The other one that I would point out that, that uh, Mr. Van Gompel provided to you, um, we moved some of these around as we looked at them a little more uh, because we wanted to get into more depth. There are three at the very bottom of the page that are proposed to use fund balance, and we feel that given the one-time nature of these expenditures that they're appropriate use of fund balance. And I believe that Russ has, uh, it, it took this an analysis as well. Yeah, we have to keep keep one or at least one for me too. The uh, the use of fund balance for the Emerald Ash Borer remediation, which is really taking down more trees. Um, the impact fee study, which is out there and discussed, as well as the update core plan. Those are all one-time expenditures. Um, that some of those may not be. Yeah, they may be a once every five or ten year or even less frequent than that. I think it's appropriate that council consider fund balance. When you take a look at this analysis, even if you count all of those plus the ones that I had initially recommended use of fund balance in my uh, budget message, that's about two and a half million, just slightly over two and a half million, two million five hundred thirty thousand. Our fund balance would still be over our maximum limit. So we're still, and I think Russ did the analysis and came up with, we still have $200,000 over our maximum. So there's certainly uh, the ability to use fund balance for one-time type of expenditures, and I, and I would argue those are still appropriate uses of fund balance. Can you, for the people at home, Mark, can you, can you explain fund balance? If I, if I wasn't involved in city government, that would mean Aliens are coming to my house for dinner. <laughs> and I will uh, have my resident alien answer that question for you. <laughs> Not an alien. <laughs> Anyways, um, from an accounting standpoint, uh, it, whether you're dealing with a business or a household, um, you have all the assets that you would acquire, namely cash and, and other assets. You have liabilities. Um, and in a business, you would have owner's equity. Um, in a government, we don't have owner's equity. Um, we have our uh, activities are accounted for in funds. So each fund on the balance sheet has a fund balance, and there's a reason for that. Um, we have very unique cash flow needs for the city. Um, you know, most businesses. Just like all cities, not just our city. All correct, city. Okay, all cities. Thank you. Um, cities in general get their tax collections at the beginning of the year, and we've talked about the broken state assistance or shared revenue or local government aid the way the structure is right now all of our local government aid 85 percent of our go local government aid comes in the month of november we get 15 percent in the month of july they do that to balance of their budget so all of this we talk about shared revenue local government aid all that comes in in the last 45 days of a calendar year so from a financial operation standpoint we have to have reserves to carry us through the year. Um, our long range finance and the city council has said that we should expect to have a minimum fund balance of 16% of our next year's expenditures to a maximum of 30%. And if you agree with the use of fund balance as proposed, our fund balance will still be at 30.37% of our next year's expenditure. So we have cushion. We are in strong financial position. The city has not always been in strong financial position. And, and if you were to go to our budget online, which is posted, um, I have a graph going back 10 years or so of our fund balance. And I'm proud to say in the last uh, five, six years that that has increased. And that is, has not always been the case. It's been increasing because our staff, our departments do an excellent job of managing their expenditures. Um, we do realistic budgets. We don't do uh, fake budgets. Um, and there are times when we budget revenues and sometimes revenues come in higher than budget, which is from a business standpoint, a good point. At a business standpoint, it's also a good point when we're under budget on expenditures. Um, right now, as I've estimated our 2022 operations, I'm showing that we'll have a positive surplus in revenue of $800,000. And for the first time in a long time, we're 
right now proposed to be over budget by about the same amount. So we're not really gaining any fund balance as I have estimated uh, based on my knowledge of year-to-date expenditures and revenues. Thank, thank you. And then, so just, just for my clarification, the money that we've put aside for for the salary and comp study, is that in fund balance or is that in a separate bucket? No, actually, um, from an accounting standpoint, we have set up a contingency amount that's in the expenditures to cover the cost to implement the uh, compensation study. So this, this would not affect the comp study that we've been promising everybody for a million years? Well, I did not show that as a reduction of our fund nope. balance. Let me just explain. Sorry. Real quick. I'll be real quick, I promise. Because that's going to be an obligation for the city for 2023 and, and into the future. So we have proposed in our levy increase enough to cover a potential impact in 2023 for our class and compensation study. I tried to be short. No, you, 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 you did a great job, far better than I could ever do. So th thank you for that input. So, Mr. Van Gompel. Deputy Mayor. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. If I just summarize, and I just, uh, Mr. Van Gompel has, has identified uh, enhancements two, three, and four as the priorities from a uh, finance standpoint, which I support, and the uh, the fund balance ones. And then certainly, you know, we are more than happy to, to dig deeper with any questions you may have about other enhancements if you if you want to talk about those or even the ones that uh, Mr. Van Gompel's prioritized, we're happy to do that as well. So um, you you mentioned the 466, that would be five cents increase. So if you move down one further to the 4.88, what would that be, six cents? Uh, yeah, I have it uh, listed. The mill rate would go from $12.07. If you do the SAB, it would be $12.15. That'd be eight cents. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Very briefly, I already spoke on it, um, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, Finance Director Van Gompel pointed out, and I just want to make sure it's extremely clear, we are in a strong financial position. The city of Oshkosh's finances are strong, and because they are so strong uh, is why we're able to attempt to hold the levy increase down. Had we not been in such a strong financial position, we possibly wouldn't be able to use $2 million in cash to pay down um, our debt increase that we're expecting, and we would instead be facing a roughly 12% levy increase had we not well, we been back in July. Yeah. yeah, had we not been in a position uh, of, of of having this much um, fund balance available to us. So just pointing out that, uh, as Finance Director Van Gompel stated, strong financial management uh, at the department head level in terms of their budgets. Um, and managing that throughout the year puts us in a, in a, in a good position to be able to, to try to maintain and, and keep that levy as low as possible. Correct. Council Mayor Wojciechowski. Thank you. Um, this is kind of a little bit of a clarification that I'm just going to have you walk me through. Um, I'm looking at the analysis of general fund balance. Um, so our estimated fund balance at the end of this year is just a little bit over $18 million. Um, and then these future 2023 20, uses um, so even after funding those, the three that are recommended here out of fund balance, and I think you said this, Mark, we still have about 200000 above what our maximum. Our max, yeah. Our maximum balance. You're tracking, yeah. Um, so with that, I think I would like to maybe see some more consideration or maybe just um, some thought put into the use of using some of that extra fund balance um, to funding at least like a one year uh, a limited time employee for the sustainability manager. Um, I completely understand what was said about um, keeping the levy as it is um, and everything that was stated. Um, I just think we have a real opportunity to bring money into this community and make a positive impact. And I think, you know, it's, I don't think I've ever, we've ever expected or heard um, you know, departments or someone suggesting a position that would, you know, fund even a little bit of its own salary, its own position. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity to bring money to this community. Um, and I would like to see, even if it's just, you know, an analysis of what that would look like, um, or how we could do that um, 
funding one year out of the fund balance and not affecting the levy in that way? Uh, from a financial perspective, typically I would not recommend doing what uh, Council Member Wojciechowski is suggesting. However, I'm going to say however, um, in, if you were to consider this a one-time or kind of a, um, a special situation, you have to go in with the eyes open that, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's not being part of the levy. Again, as I stated earlier, this process is really a legislative process. Um, I think I've fulfilled my obligations as finance director to give you the information that you should have to make your decisions. Um, and and the, the rationale behind that is was explained through our work session. And this is just the next step before the public hearing. If you don't take any action tonight, we could still have budget enhancements up to and including we have the possibility of a work session after the public hearing. I would strongly encourage you to come to a consensus if one or any budget enhancements would be considered at least by November uh, 2nd when we have the public hearing um, because I would like to give the numbers finalized. I don't want to be sitting here on the night of the adoption of the budget scrambling to look at levy and levy impacts. I can uh, spend a lot of time to give you whatever information you need up to that point, but then um, for, from a financial perspective, we have to start the process to levy uh, the taxes, and that's a whole other administrative function that takes us during the month of November into the first week of December, maybe sometimes longer, to get that all wrapped up. So. I'm just trying to outline our calendar on how we move forward. Um, if you want to do a pilot program for SAB manager for one year, we, you certainly have the fund balance to do that if that is the desire of the majority of the council. And I'll just add, and the, I'm thinking similar along lines, and not even that it has to be a sustainability manager as it's presented, um, but almost you know to start off similar to what we did with the DEI um, consultant that we've had um, that is a one-time expense um, and that's almost been similar like a pilot program to see you know what potentially a DEI coordinator could look like I mean I know they've been extremely helpful um, with helping the departments with trainings things like that the uh, committee um, with developing their plan um, so I almost think it's worth you know doing something similar like that whether it's like a sustainability it, um, a consultant or something like that um, like I said, I think there's an opportunity to bring money in through grants, and I know a lot of other cities have saved lots of money through energy efficiency and things like that, so just something to think about. And if I could also um, bring up, you know, um, one of the questions I had was whether or not what's been described in the sustainability, sustainability manager position description is you know maybe not an elegant solution but are there pieces of that that um, could potentially be requested either through as Councilmember Wojtowski mentioned uh, you know a, a contract or uh, does East Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission have the capacity um, as a member of East Central uh, to request that through their their work plan um, you know I don't I don't have those answers but um, certainly, I, I think there are several of us who are interested in finding out what those other options are. And again, with the idea that it sustains at least in part um, what it intends along with the, the work product that the position description and the sustainability advisory board spirit of that intends. So it sounds like we're back here on November 2nd with another work session. Um, and that is also the public hearing uh, for folks out there watching, uh, the opportunity to uh, speak on these items. Uh, question, the item that we received in our packets, is that also now updated with the current agenda packet for folks to download if they have an interest in seeing this? because. I don't know if this is publicly uh, 
circulated? I, I do not know the answer to that question. I okay. had submitted it to the city manager's um, administrative assistant. Um, and I don't know if when I checked on Tuesday, it the one on the in, uh, on the website still had the an earlier version. Um, so I would think I could work with the city manager's office to make sure that gets updated tomorrow. Yeah, technically we shouldn't be replacing the agenda because the agenda was published, but there's ways to get it out. And I think what you're open for. Yeah, is just highlighting these these I'd be tough happy to decisions. Under, for, I'd be happy to put under hot for, topics for, on the web page. Exactly. And, and, and you know, just go right to the first page. So, Madam Mayor, if I may, just the additional comment. Uh, for people listening tonight, um, if you go to the City of Oshkosh website under budgets and financial information, the entire budget is out there for people to review prior to the public hearing. Um, Pay particular see, attention to the executive summary. <laughs> and I have this page in that summary, um, and you will find it there. This, I can, this up, current I can update that. No, okay. not right now, but tomorrow morning okay. it would be updated. Um, in addition... Uh, our long range finance committee made a suggestion that we um, increase our efforts to publicize our public hearing process and uh, the city manager will be recording a, uh, a special edition of the city manager's report uh, this week. I'm not sure when it's going to be aired, um, but it, it will be a review of the budget uh, document and just an update. Uh, to help inform the residents of the public hearing on November 2nd. And if I, if I could also add um, to or echo, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councilmember Miller, Councilmember Ford, other and, and such have, you know, asked for, and I think, you know, one of the frustrating things coming out of those workshops again was there didn't seem to be, you know, a high or any like prioritization. It was, I think it was referenced as kind of a la carte. I mean, I could see a couple of here, a couple of items here, you know, whether it's police officers and life and death, you know, uh, narcotics vice uh, officers, or whether it's, you know, critical crisis, uh, climate crisis. It seems to be that there are some urgent items in here, and, um, you know, we, we probably should have a little more, I think, categorization of the the urgency of of some of these items I think the water um, public works mentioned you know what they're facing in the next year and some of the the high need and expectations of that department so it would be I think a little more helpful to just like we have the criteria for you know our CIP of the you know nice to have versus the absolutely must um, I think that's uh, you know, we heard that obviously from the departments, but um, you're right, it is a legislative matter. So that would be helpful by the second. And I'm sorry, Council Member Ford's been waiting. Oh, that's okay. Um, just, just two things, uh, two things quickly. I, the, um, I don't know if there's any consensus or discussion or other people want to weigh in about the use of fund balance for those, for those items. I'm totally fine with that. I, I think that's consistent with the policy the long range finance passed um, in their wisdom. Um, so that's perfectly fine with me. On the larger stuff, I mean, I just think we got to be really cautious. I, I think Director Van Gompel was very correct saying that we are lucky that we are in a financially strong situation that has enabled us to weather some of these some of these storms. But look at that. How, how do you get yourself into into a rough financial situation? How does that happen? It's not one big thing. It's like a it's like a plane crash. You ever watch air disasters? I don't know, my eyes don't light up on that, but. It's a great show. It's not one big thing that goes wrong. It's a bunch of little things. They compound over time. Um, and that's, I, I'm very worried about going down that road. And a lot of it is because of the external situation that we're, that we're facing and that we're going to be facing over the next few years. So I just want to leave you with that. And Pilot air and weather, Mike. Pilot air and weather. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I heard all of your comments. Um, and again, I went out on a limb a little bit to prioritize these enhancements as a recommendation from a financial standpoint and you, you are correct um, I mean from a pure financial position um, if we stick with the base budget that's going to be the safe route but I think there's room for you to make some consideration if you desire uh, to to expand on that 
Now, in, um, in your red folder, you also had an updated information, and I think we had the, all of the budget enhancement forms, whether you know mm -hmm. you appreciate it or not, the department heads did do a, a good job, and we actually had some additional supplements, and one of them is in your red folder tonight, which is from the water and wastewater. I had some additional conversations after our budget workshops with a public works director, James Robbie, and um, I had expressed concerns about the number of requests uh, in staffing, and I asked them to prioritize their needs um, in a separate document, and you should have that document to review and consider. Um, from a financial standpoint, I'm comfortable with up to uh, two positions, I think. Uh, four positions will put a, a bigger burden and strain on our future rates, as Council Member Miller alluded to earlier. Um, but I think we have the strength to consider one, maybe two, but one is probably the safest route. Thank you for that input and the hard work. No problem. And I think the number one that's in there, the water filtration operator, I think our new uh, utilities operations manager stated it as well as I could expect from, uh, from anyone. He shared his experiences because he's coming to that job from the wastewater side. And there are eight operators at the sewer treatment plant, but only six operators at the filtration plant. And I think that's why, in discussing it with Mr. Ellis and Mr. Robbie, that's why that's number one on the utilities list. And that's just, um, in order to attract people, I think that's what Mr. Ellis talked about. It's not an attractive job because of the, the schedule that would be demanded. And uh, getting at least up to seven is better than six. And yeah. it'll, be, it'll be a good start. So yeah. that's why that one and, and to that's top. That, that's that's the position and I'm sorry I'm getting the positions screwed up here but James don't don't come up here just you can answer from back there correct me if I'm wrong but is that the position where they're literally having to work two weekends a month all right sorry I was trying to make it easy for you but that's the 24 7 365 I, 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 I understand that but but it I, I just want to make sure that this is the position it, it'll be easier for everybody else who's listening to hear as well. Yes, that is the position. They're working two weekends a month, and at one point in time on their schedules, uh, seven straight days on either second or third shift right now. Okay. So, so it's a real attractive shift. Sarcastically, yes. <laughs> all right. Thanks. I didn't mean to. That's all right. Mayor. Yep. Um, I appreciate Finance Director Van Goppel giving some, some, some insight from the financial perspective. I want to put City Manager Roloff on, at least on, on the hot seat a little bit. He can handle it. Um, are you prepared to, to put your name to paper and, and give us your prioritization of these requests in time for us to uh, possibly make decisions um, you know, before the public hearing? Yes, I'll be prepared. And, and I, I, I support what Russ had talked about. Items two, three, and four, those enhancements on the levy side, I think are the three highest priorities. And certainly the fund balance ones just make sense rather than even thinking about dipping into fund balance. And uh, we've given you the utility top one. We can discuss the other ones, but if you want to be impactful, yet try to get some semblance of balance, and I appreciate all the statements, those would be the, the start. Um, but I'll be prepared to talk to you about the other ones as well. And I know the other department heads, uh, they'll be here as well to answer questions. If you've got, if you've got a question about any of these that, that we haven't mentioned, I think it's, in, I think it's appropriate to let the departments uh, speak their piece. As you can see, there are a lot of things that have been added to their plate in recent years, probably more on the utility side because these are brand new mandates that are coming down, as opposed to, you know, in the case of, for example, the curator educator, we cut the position during um, uh, during Acts 10 and 32 because of the, the cuts, and the museum offered that up very regretfully, 
and now it's coming to roost because we lost our national accreditation because of that. Our uh, number of kids going to the museum is down. Families are going down. So I can give you a sob story for every one of these, and they're all legitimate. Some are based on decisions we've made. Other, others are based on mandates that were there. I would argue that I, I would challenge any business in town to top us as the most regulated business in this community. I think we're the most regulated business in this community. I think Mr. Robbie would attest to that. So Council we will Mayor give Miller. it to you. Thank you, Mayor. M Mark, I want to be clear. Not once have I heard in our discussions we don't think that, that these requests come with, with, with a sob story and, and simple realities of they, they are needed. It's, 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 it's balancing what the hell can we afford. And, and we can't afford 20 enhancements. And, and, and I don't mean that sarcastically, I just mean that factually. Mike talked about air disasters. You, you know, they're all, they're all avoided by making a lot of good decisions on the ground. And I, I think that's what we're trying to do is, is come up with that balance of good decisions on the ground before we take off. So thank you one and all. I, I have a, another question and that is um, on item six for the sustainability manager um, and we list out planning services. So as I understand it, um, planning services are, there is a 20% of CDBG for administration um, allowance. What does that come to about uh, 160 roughly 160 thousand yeah. dollars um, and earlier this year we passed an environmental justice resolution where language was placed in that we would be looking at things with an environmental justice lens but if we are restricting the hours of four hours per week for staff I guess my question is um, given the vulnerable populations and the discussion of environmental justice, you know, does the CDBG administrative dollars, um, how does that connect here in, on the levy piece side well, of it? Where it connects, the reason that that person can only work, and that's 10% of their time, is because in some cases they're already funded by some CDBG dollars, and we can't have them work on something that is not, uh, we, that we can demonstrate as benefiting low and moderate income uh, individuals. So we don't want to charge, if somebody's working a fifth hour of the week on SAB and it can't, it, they're charging that to CDBG, that would be inappropriate. So we're very strict on sure. keeping, keeping that limit there. And that's something that Kelly has to balance. And I talked long enough for Kelly to come up to the front, but that's a real challenge that, that every community has with CDBG. They just can't, uh, just hide a staff position there. It's got to be directly related to that. Yeah, certainly we do get audited um, by actually our city auditors and HUD auditors to ensure that we are using the CDBG admin funds properly. With that though, um, we do have some flexibility within our CDBG admin funds. Um, right now we aren't taking the maximum amount just because um, it is um, it is um, funding some position well, a position and a half within our department, um, but there might be some room. I don't have that exact amount offhand, um, but there might be some where they would really um, have to focus on LMI um, activities. But that is something we could potentially look at if council does want us to investigate further. Well, it goes to your point that you asked to put on a future agenda because the multitude and particularly for Ms. Nyforth's department, she has more responsibility for boards and commissions than, than any other department, not even close. Um, and there's a restriction we put on the person who supports the Landmarks Commission. Not that we don't love Landmarks. Uh, rental housing, uh, that was a new initiative that was added a few years ago, so that's there. Um, I know you could go on with others, but that's, I mean, and not including the plan commission, which is one of the, the primary uh, boards and commissions. I'm not sure of others that you can cite. Yeah, it's, it's a balance, really. I mean, we tried to give enough time to all the boards and commissions as staff liaisons to help move forward their goals and implement plans, but at the same time, we still have 
you know, as part of our full-time job, just implementing long-term plans, doing zoning. Um, we share those duties, code enforcement. So it's really a balance that we, we do have to monitor to make sure that we're, um, you know, doing everything fairly and supporting all the different activities that we are in charge of in our division. Thank you. So we have a little work to do for next Wednesday. We'll do that. Um, and look forward to other input because we still have that. Um, the charts that, that were shown up earlier, the reason we had those ready is because those are the charts that are going to be in there. So uh, Councilmember Miller, that, that whole page, I think Russ has asked staff uh, to chop those up so that we can show those because every one of those. This is an excellent pictures. document. This, this, this sums it up for everybody at home, and, and it's just a, a snapshot. So. So we're going to talk about that as well, but uh, given the discussion about the enhancements, we'll make sure we, we get that out there as well. And I would be remiss in asking uh, where we're at in terms of bringing the special assessment uh, transportation utility fee discussion into, um, it, it seems to have just kind of fallen off the radar where that lies with regard to this budget for next year. I think a lot of it was waiting what's going on with the um, city of Pewaukee. I got to make sure city it's city of Pewaukee and their lawsuit village. It is the village. Thank you. Uh, I, I met with I met with the administrator there last week and I've known him for 20 years and I still think he's with the city of Pewaukee uh, village of Pewaukee. Uh, so that they're still waiting. Uh, their structure is almost identical to ours. They used SCH and everything. So we've been awaiting that. But if council wants to um, rekindle that, you know, we, we did have a discussion with you in closed session about the, the legal elements of that. We can certainly bring it back if the council wants us to. Madam Mayor? Yes. Uh, just a, a quick a bit of information. This uh, two page document, how my tax, property tax dollars distributed does get mailed out with the tax bills. It's an insert. Uh, I don't know if you remember over last year when, when you got your tax bill, um, we include this uh, as an insert to the tax bill. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's excellent. You can look down and you can say, well, what, is it, what does it cost for my police protection? It costs the average house, you know, you know $22 a month. To me, yeah, you know, that, that simplifies things, so, and you can, whether you agree that that's valuable or expensive, it, it's right there and it, it's real easy to find. And, and I think the reason I went to the monthly cost is, you know, unfortunately the tax bills get sent out in December, which is not really a pleasant time for most families. And if you were to, and, and they're expected to make a payment in January and, and other payments, you know, they have the option of other payments. Um, but I don't think a lot of people take that dollar amount and, and put it into a monthly basis. And it's not that I'm trying to sell anything, I'm just trying to explain, you know, what it costs to provide city services. No, it, it's excellent. Well, that and you're putting it in something that's relevant in terms of, or at least relatable. I mean, when you, as, as uh, consumers, you know, when we're paying a hundred and some dollars per month for cable, another hundred and some dollars a month for internet and we're okay with paying a hundred and some dollars a month for a cell phone when you start putting that in relation to it costs five dollars a month to pick up your trash and recycling that's not so bad for for the, for the value that that we provide i would agree and, and a lot of times that gets lost in the translation and i think a lot of times local governments don't do a good job of telling their story um, and trying to make it relatable, and that's what I've attempted to do. That just reminded me, um, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, in, in previous budgets, um, we had a, a comparison of peer communities, of how much we spend on public safety, on a, kind of this similar breakdown, but there was, a, it seemed to me up until about two years ago, um, that was a very good visual tool for seeing how much we do 
on the lower end of that. And I guess my, my question is, do we not provide that anymore? Um, Madam Mayor, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that was done in one of our budget uh, prep workshops, like no, number okay. two. Okay. Um, if you, if Early you in need the summer. a refresher on that, I certainly have that. But um, that, that information comes from uh, the Wisconsin Public Policy Forum. Okay. Um, and it's taking data from state uh, collected resources. And it's somewhat dated. Um, I think we have 2021 numbers is the latest that's accumulated statewide. Um, but I can certainly share that back with council. If I'm you... sorry if my memory, if, if it's okay. been more recent than two years, it, that's some I'm, of these that's here to help you. Yeah, appreciate that. Anybody else? Questions, suggestions, ideas? Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, um, and we are now at council member announcements and statements. Do any uh, council members have statements? Okay, city manager announcements and statements then. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, th speaking of communications, uh, the Public Works Department is contracted with a company called Kane Communications Group uh, to address issues about them communicating with the public and uh, across all of the different areas, whether it's uh, utilities or um, uh, utilities or refuse collection or things like that. So uh, excited that uh, they recognize the value of uh, of good. Uh, relations with the public and they're going to be working on that contract they did an RFP uh, request for proposal or qualifications and selected this group um, <clears throat> that's uh, 34 35 we've got a stormwater management assistance uh, it's an amendment to an agreement we already have with AECOM uh, in accordance with our purchasing policy I'm uh, pointing that one out uh, also a good segue to third quarter strategic plan updates are, are, are posted on the website uh, certainly welcome you to take a look at those if you have any questions uh, we're happy to do that and uh, update of outstanding issues is also there for uh, your perusal and any questions if you have them that's all I have madam mayor um, I do have a follow-up question I'm sorry back on um, item 29 our joint meeting with the school board uh, this Thursday uh, shouldn't we have had the agenda shouldn't we have received the agenda by now it's been posted oh okay emails. yeah um, there's basically th four items um, okay it hasn't changed then that's that, that was not the final. changed no, okay that's no. what I wanted to know all right very good that's all I have madam mayor and with that we'll take a motion to adjourn so moved second all in favor aye, aye. aye. beat you for it